Hi, um, a while ago I looked at a Pulse uh, DIN rail power supply. Um, Pulse are sort of fairly high in manufacture of um, DIN rail industrial power supplies. Um, and they sent me this one to have a look. This is a, a new one, this is the CPS 10 range. A um, couple of unusual features. One is it's pretty small. This is a 24 volts 10 amp power supply, so 240 watts nominal. And it's pretty small for that, for that sort of um, power range. It's also got very high efficiency, which that really goes hand in hand. If you've got high efficiency, you've got less heat to deal with, so you can sort of make, make things smaller. Um, this is a 90, this is claimed to be 94.8% efficient on a 230 volt input. I've not actually measured it, but it's fairly plausible, which is pretty unusual for um, sort of DIN rail power supplies. And so, in this sort of size without a fan, um, it's a pretty compact, um, compact little unit. Also, I've run this for about an hour and a half at full load, and um, the air coming out the top and the sides don't get above 40 degrees C. And they actually say that if your ambient is less than 45 degrees, you can actually overrun this by 20%. So that gives you about 288 watts output. So it's you know, there's obviously lots of margin if you're running it within the um, you know, the 240 watt spec. It's you know it's not stressing anything. So I think you can have confidence that it's going to be quite reliable. Um, they give a three year warranty on it. So I thought I'd just take a quick look inside, see what they've done to uh, get this efficiency. I've already taken all the screws out. Just take a look. And again, like on the um, the other unit I looked at, they've distributed the heatsink quite well. So we've got the bridge rectifier front end, which is heatsink to this side. Um, the main switching devices, the MOSFETs, are on the rear, and then the output devices are actually on the uh, on the right hand side. So this whole surface area is quite well spread out. We haven't got any sort of hot spots on there. Now one thing they did on the uh, the other unit I looked at, they haven't quite managed on here, on the other one all the electrolytics were right on the bottom so they were getting the, the cold air flow through. They've not quite managed that on this one, um, the output caps are up here but there's nothing underneath here that gets particularly warm so it should still get a, a fairly good air, yeah, cool air flow um, over those capacitors. And there's also yeah, very few electrolytics, you've got the main re input reservoir, the outputs and one other one, and that's it, there's no other electrolytics. And in particular there's no electrolytics on the, um, the low voltage control side, which is a very common failure mode. Um, a lot of switch mode power, supply, power supplies I've looked at, um, probably 50% of them, um, the fault has been the electrolytic on the um, start up supply. Uh, failing over time, and the, the symptom of that is they'll, they'll switch off and then when you switch them on again they don't start up. So they, they've hopefully eliminated that uh, failure mode. So just looking at the uh, the overall architecture of this, we've got the mains coming in through a fuse, capacitor, um, comm mode choke, some more um, capacitors on here, input rectifier. Um, now here we've got an inrush limiter. Most of the most, if not all, the pulse range have this inrush limiting system because um, one issue if you've got a lot of power supplies on one on one supply rail, you turn them on, they take quite a big peak current because of the rectifier going into the main reservoir capacitor, and that can cause problems with things like tripping circuit breakers and so on. So what they've done, they seem to have, um, although they've used what looks like fairly traditional NTC inrush limiters, they put a relay across it so that about a second or so after it starts up, it shorts that out. So these NTCs probably have a much higher resistance than um, the conventional inrush limiters that don't have the relay bypass. So it means that you turn it on, it, you know, it charges the capacitor sort of fairly gently, then shorts out the, these resistors to um, reduce any uh, losses within that, which again is probably also a contributor to the efficiency. And there's a couple more capacitors and another filter choke there, so tons of input filtering as you'd expect on an industrial power supply. Um, you've got this main um, input capacitor, that's a Rubicon, decent quality capacitor. And then the main switching devices are actually on the back here, there's some sort of heat coupling, I'm not sure if that's ceramic or a thermally conductive plastic, it feels quite cold and clammy which means that it's conducting, you know, if you touch something um, and it feels sort of fairly cold that means it's pu pulling the heat away from your finger so that tells you it's quite thermally conductive and there's some surface mount MOSFETs so this will be the, um, the power factor correction and the main switching um, MOSFETs on the back of here. Also, you've got a nice little big isolation gap on the uh, PCB between the uh, high and low voltage sections. Um, one, one thing that's a little bit unusual, this is actually a resonant mode converter. Um, lower end cheaper supplies tend to use flyback conversion. Um, what this does, this effectively forms a tuned circuit with the main inductor and this capacitor. Now there's a couple of advantages of resonant mode. Um, what they tend to do is say, with a conventional converter you sort of in, yeah, turn Turn, switch, switch, switch the uh, current onto the primary of the transformer, it 
stores energy in the the um, magnetically, it then releases that, and that also flies out the other end and um, transfers the energy. But one problem with that is, is when you're switching it, you're switching fairly high currents. So the point about resonant mode is it's running basically at a constant frequency, and you only switch it on and off at the, near the zero crossing points of the sine wave, which means that your switching losses are greatly reduced because normally if you when a MOSFET turns on there'll be some period of time between when it's completely off and when it's completely on where it's in some intermediate resistance and that's quite a major cause of losses particularly as your frequency increases you know you tend to want to work at a fairly high frequency because that means your inductors and capacitors can be smaller but the point is that yeah that increases your switching losses so using a resonant converter um, reduces that significantly it also reduces noise as well because you're not switching the high current you're not generating as much in the way of transient so your EMT performance is better and um, that also probably means that you lose less you know if you ha don't have to have so much filtering at the front end you've got less resistive losses in those filters as well uh, the main controller is this this is a an NXP TEA 1716T which is quite a complex device this handles both the path factor correction stage and the main switching stage and it's quite a complex device it's got yeah one of the disadvantages with the resonance topology is the control is quite a lot more complex but yeah once you've got that into an IC that's becomes less of an issue um, some various control stuff on the bottom, um, the only sort of slightly unusual thing, we've got a, an AT Tiny 13 here and that's just going to be doing some management um, functions because most most pulse power supplies are designed to run, to provide a, a short term over overload capability um, and that's managed it, or, yeah, in software so that if you've overloaded it for a certain amount of time it then makes sure that um, the thermal limits aren't exceeded by just making sure that if there's a yeah if that overload persists for too long it shuts down. The other thing you notice on the resistors which are the clearly high higher voltage ones where you've got several in series they they use these MELF resistors which I'm guessing that's probably because they've got a high voltage rating. So you can see the fact that sort of the chain of the series will be the ones that have got high voltage across them. And there's a few other just various odd um passes and discretes and so on uh, on the bottom of here. Um, the other obvious thing, um, which is again fairly unusual, which I think again we, is where they're getting some of the efficiency from, on the output of the transformer you normally have sort of a couple of diodes. Um, with a resonant converter it tends to be more of a sort of full wave rectifier, but they're not using diodes, they're using MOSFETs here, so they, they're actually using synchronous rectification. So instead of a diode um, relying on the polarity across the diode to switch it on and off, which means you always have a voltage drop of typically sort of 0.4 to maybe 0.5 volts on a sort of shocky rectifier, um, they use a MOSFET which is designed to switch on at the times when it knows that the output should be on. So that means you get much lower losses in your output devices. And then it goes into the capacitor. I can't actually see what make these capacitors are because the uh, it's hidden by that PCB. But I'm sure those are going to be decent quality uh, electrolytics there. Um, this output cap here. This is another Rubicon cap here. And obviously, yeah, the general construction is quite nice. It's got um, sort of this main base PCB. These two daughter boards go into the uh, soldered in into holes in the PCB. It's all sort of feels sort of nice solid there, overall build quality is quite nice so um, yeah it's just quite interesting to take a look at that so there's a few slightly unusual features on there but um, seems quite nice yeah as you'd expect you know a nicely made um, nicely made unit that you can have sort of fairly good confidence that um, it's going to last obviously yeah these aren't cheap power supplies I don't know what the actual cost of this is but um, yeah in an industrial scenario your power supply is probably a fairly low pr proportion of your overall cost so you know it's worth spending a little bit of extra on a power supply that you know you know is going to be um, reliable uh, one other um, slightly unusual thing this is actually specified as well as for running on the usual range of AC, sort of 100 to 240, it's also a spec to run on a DC supply. Now that's for systems where you want a battery backup. Um, so instead of having to have like a separate UPS, you can you make it more, if you arrange that you've got a, you know, your battery supply is um, around that voltage, you can switch the inputs over so you're using the same power supply, um, whether you're running off AC or DC, which again is probably a lot more common in industrial type applications than others, but um, again, it's, it, it's a, in, you don't often see power supplies are actually specifically specified to run on uh, DC. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the terminals on here, these are just for the, uh, there's an output of DC OK, is a relay on there that gives you contact closure to tell you that the uh, supply is OK and you've got a, a trim range uh, control on the front of it. But um, yeah, another quite nice little unit from Pulse.